Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to our 32nd annual festival and to our conversation about love and stuff. I want to thank tonight's sponsor, the Jewish Women's Archive, and our partner on tonight's film, the Boston Women's Film Festival. And now it's with great pleasure that I am going to introduce Judith Halfend, the filmmaker of Love and Stuff. Welcome. Hi. So happy to be here. I'm in my kitchen. Uh, in front of a lot of stuff that you might have seen in the movie. <laughs> I, I actually want to start by asking you about that because at the end of the film you paint everything white and then you're in front of this beautiful yellow color. Oh well that was my white living room. It's still white. Um, this is the kitchen. It's yellow. It's been yellow. <laughs> Thea said she wanted everything back to yellow. So right. I didn't know if this was the transformation. Uh, no, the, it was, the living room had a lot of yellow and it was yellow and white. But this is like mamash yellow. This, this stayed yellow. Anyway. Uh, well, it looks great. Um, I, I want to start by asking you about um, how you came to make this film into a feature. I know it started as an op doc short film for the New York Times um, and that short focused on your relationship to your mother and your mother's death. Um, and, and the feature, of course, bring, brings us Theo. Um, when did you know that there was a feature film there? Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, so basically the, that, that, that little op doc, which, um, you know, if, if people want to see the, the genesis of this movie, all they have to do is Google love and stuff, New York Times and they'll find it. Um, that ends in my living room after we get all the stuff there. And, um, and then I have that moment, which I think a lot of people have um, when after their, 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 their parent has passed and they, they're like, at some point they, they, they think to themselves, oh my God, I, I, I gotta call my mom and say, we got home okay. Or, oh, I got to call her and check in and say, hey. And so I had that moment, like we got all the stuff into the living room and the living room was piled with stuff. And my window seat was piled high with all those boxes and you really couldn't quite see the view anymore. But I was home and I was safe and I thought, oh my God, I got to call her. Um, and which of course I couldn't. And, um, and the movie ends with that feeling. And then that's when we have that little clip um, when I ask her mom, how do you live without your mother? And she says, well, you do, you just learn to. Um, so the way that I learned to start living without my mother was to make a movie about her. And so I think in a way it was like, I, I pushed off, uh, I mean, I was in a lot of grief, believe me, I was in a lot of grief, but before I got, you know, while I was in the deepest of grief and I knew that that was going to I knew that that was gonna happen. That's when I called Dan Gold, the amazing cinematographer, one of them, you know, and said, you gotta help me shoot this stuff. Just come over and help me shoot this stuff. So, you know, and then, and then we, then all that stuff came home. And when did I know that, you know, and then I had, it was only after it came home that I started making the movie, right? I mean, I was shooting it all, but then we had to edit it. And we edited the movie in, my apartment so um and then at a certain point yeah so we at a certain point while we were editing the movie in the apartment i got this phone call about this baby so you know i was probably at my lowest on my way to that passover seder the first mm -hmm. one without my mother and then i got the phone call about theo and you know i wasn't quite smart enough to say to everyone at the seder table I'm going to be sitting here on a telephone trying to figure out how to get to yes. Could y'all like shoot that? Or I'll tell you like someone shoot this so that I have that material. Like I didn't quite do that. So I don't have that amazing moment when they were all like, Dainu, 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 just do it, just do it, just do it. Um, but this baby came home four days later and uh, I, I, I said, Dan, you, you probably need to come back and shoot this. And so on one of those days, yeah, one of those days he shot, I mean, you saw, I mean, I was like in the thick of it with all of those people trying to figure out like, how do I make space for this baby and what do I do? And 
I guess I knew at that moment, the story, the saga, the story is going to continue, but it wasn't going to be a feature. I mean, what I thought we would do was probably make a lot more 10 minute shorts or make five 20 minute pieces or that it would be a series. And so I shot it in mind thinking, okay, this, so this is going to be this series. I should be one of those filmmakers that makes a series. All the series shouldn't all just be about murderers. Maybe it's about life. Maybe it's about coming to grips with huge transformations we have to make. Maybe we can make a series about becoming a new old mom in your 50s. Like, why not that series? So that's what we tried to do. And I got two producers who believed in me to come along for the ride. And we tried for a really long time to turn it into a series and it didn't quite work. We couldn't quite find a platform. Nobody jumped at it and said yes. And, but people did say, why don't you just make it into a feature? Like, I bet you could just make it into a feature. So we finally decided, okay, we'll make it into a feature. And probably around that time, everyone started wanting series. Anyway, enough said, we continued and we shot until she was about four and a half years old. Wow. And how old is she now? She's six and a half. That was a question that just came in and, and we will be taking questions soon. So if you have them, uh, please She's in do the other ask room. I, she might, she might run in and out. I mean, Great. She, she and Denise are in the other room. Oh, wow. It could happen. There could be a cameo. <laughs> that's, I mean, De Denise is also such a, I, I love seeing Denise sort of become a part of your family during, during the course of the film. Well, she's become more of a part of my family during the course of COVID because there was a moment when, you know, I, I to be quite honest, um, and I'm sure maybe you're gonna ask me this, but, you know, I was, I have worked, I've always worked, I've always had to work and I've had to work a lot. And she's always gone to daycare, you know, since she's almost two. And, um, you know, it wasn't until like COVID and we were under like serious lockdown and we were alone together for six weeks that I was like, I've never spent this much time alone with you by myself my whole life. Like, I don't really exactly know how to, like, this is hard. This is so hard. So at a certain point, I mean, it was just, it was hard. And uh, so Den when, when, when Denise felt like it was safe enough, we opened up our pod and she came and she lived with us for like almost wow. two months. Wow. So that we could like get Theo through first grade and graduate, get her through kindergarten into first grade. <laughs> wow. Yeah. I could have made a movie about did that. You, I, did I, not make, no. <laughs> I did not make the homeschool hell, remote school hell, uh, lockdown movie. Other people have or they will. I didn't. I didn't. I, that sort of bleeds into the question that I wanted to ask you from what you were saying earlier. I was sort of surprised when you said I wasn't smart enough to have people film that Seder because what's so incredible about the film and also sort of what makes me wonder about um, what it would have looked like as a series is you have so much footage sort of from different periods in your life in conversation with with each other there's you know your mother appears in your life um in the film like after her death of course um through through footage and so when when do you shoot and when do you when do you not shoot and 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 is there's there's so many people telling you well your your father and and people hi <laughs> can you say hi no. Why not? You know, look, do you know what it says? It says Boston Jewish film. And look, there's our cousin, Deb Elbaum. Say hi, cousin Deborah. Yep. Um, yeah. I was just asking your this mom if she's always shooting. Am I always film. shooting? No. What and, was and the best in the about, movie? Would you know what? We're talking about Love and Stuff, which is the big movie that we made together. What, um, what, what, what's been the best part? Has it been getting to know grandma? Yeah. 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 Okay. And that came from a deep. And what? Now who went into a deep, deep sleep? Oh, she did fall into a deep sleep. It's true. So I put this paper here. Okay. Just All right. It. Okay. Thanks. Theo probably has memorized the movie. I know I have that. 
She memorized the movie. Okay, bye. So now everyone can see that she grew a lot. She has grown a lot. Um, so what was it like to share the movie with her? I mean, and, and even you said it's our movie. So, so do you think of it as a movie oh. we made together with her? Well, you know, I was making two movies at the same time since she was born, right? So I, I was making this movie called Cook Survival by Zip Code, which is actually the television version is on uh, Independent Lands. You could watch it for free. Um, and I was making Love and Stuff. And, you know, it was just like, so, so shooting was always like, it was just a part of our life. It was like, she would often sometimes say to me like, is the crew coming over today? Is there gonna be a crew around? Um, and you could see, she sort of gets really comfortable with it, right? At one point she looks up and she talks to, you know, um, my, our friend Amber, who was shooting a scene, you know, when I was able to sit down and get back up and we had our tea party, which was a big goal for me. And, um, you know, she's looking at Amber like, Amber, you should sit down and eat with us. And then you could pick your camera up and shoot and like, what's wrong with you? Come on. And um, so it's just, it was sort of normal for her. I, I mean, right now she's sort of, she's, she's not so into it right now. I think it kind of bugs her. She doesn't want me to be taping her. And I, I do, I mean, I tape a lot of things and I'm constantly documenting our life together just because she's growing up and I want it. I don't know what I'm doing with it. Um, but having her, she was just, you know, she's watched me do it. And at a certain point, she was like watching the rough cuts with me and she was watching the fine cuts with me. And she was watching me rewrite and record narration. And, or, she, or I would have to say, shh, mommy's recording narration. And she would like sit and she would watch. And so she's watched every iteration of this film. And I think, she just, she's, she's learned. I mean, it was a goal of mine. I think that was my fantasy. I wanted to get that footage out of storage. Um, I wanted to get that footage out of storage so I could go in and I could find the gems because I had this fantasy that inside all of that footage, my parents would help me parent. That somehow if I got those into our life, somehow I'd be able to use them. I don't know if I knew how they would actually formulate a film. Like that's really something that the editors came up with and that we came up with together. But, you know, using those moments as a portal between the past and the present and finding the language for this, for this movie, uh, the language of parenting through a transom or parenting from the past into the present and using all those crazy old movies that they probably didn't want me to shoot either as this way to do that. What it ultimately became was a way for Theo to feel my parents being alive. And so, you know, that's how I learned how to live without my mother. I made her become alive again in through this movie and the making of this movie. And, and to some extent it's worked. I mean, Theo, I think, she has a real deep connection with her. I mean, you know, she knows that puppies, you know, she knows, she knows that, you know, she knows which candlesticks my mother gave me that had belonged to my grandmother. She, you know, she's, she's conversant with a lot of the things in our life, in our house. And, you know, I did make the right choice of trying to integrate those things into our life. So like, you asked me earlier when we were waiting for everyone to join us, you know, what are, how is she gonna relate to th certain things? I mean, I hope she relates to my things, whatever it is I, I leave for her and I hope it's organized and I hope that I do with her what I didn't do with my mother. <laughs> um, but like my, you know, at the worst moments of COVID when we were fighting about like the stupidest things, you know, like, pouring syrup and I was like giving her the whole thing to pour and then she would pour too much and then we would argue about what is too much and the muchness of syrup and all of that and then my mother like talked to me somehow she said sweetie you know that egg cup that you decided you needed of mine pour the syrup in the egg cup and then give her Bubby's egg cup and then say 
Bobby says, this is the right amount of syrup. And so I did that and I gave it to her. And then my mother said, she just wants to feel what it's like to pour. She just wants the abundance of whatever it is. Give her the abundance without giving her the bottle. So, you know, that's, my mother would have told me that over the phone if, if she was alive and I was telling her how mean and stupid I had been around syrup. And she would say, think about this for a second. Use the egg cup. So, you know, that's been, that's sort of like, that's what has happened somehow like making the movie taught me a lot of lessons. And it also taught me that I'm a work in progress, that I'm never gonna get it 100% right, that it's always gonna be hard, that I'm constantly gonna be reinventing, that I'm always gonna get a second, I'm, I hope, that if I'm kind to myself, I'll, get, I'll always give myself a second chance and I'll teach Theo how to do that. And um, um, you know, that I didn't, I didn't work anything out. All I worked out is that this is hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you you mentioned um, I you, when you said in the film, my my mother isn't in the babka and my mother isn't in the skirt, and um, and you talked about the momishness, which I, I really like that phrase of the objects that your mother gave you, um, and it, it sounds like part of what what you've come to is that it's it's in your sort of memories of her, but. But I'm interested in um, how the connection between the footage that you you know you said you 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 brought your mother back to life through through working on the film, but also through these objects. And is editing is editing a film at all similar to editing these objects that you brought home? Um, hmm, that's really interesting. Well, I don't know that uh i mean the interesting thing about bringing objects into is editing the objects into your life i mean the re the real trick to it is like when you use them and when you extend the meaning of that into your life and it becomes part of your story and um i think that's what we were trying to do with the footage we were trying to make the footage not feel like an artifice but to feel like this important portal that 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 somehow helped me help you know I use the the past to help me make sense of the present and go like that and you know the the objects that I've kept that I am now able to use as part of our life uh, that 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 I'm imprinting you know with the story of Theo I mean that's kind of like making a movie. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the, the objects really do come to life when, when, when you use them and when they're accessible, not when they're in storage, storage doesn't work, you know, <laughs> but like having it around and being able to kind of like use it when you need to, hey, sweetheart, you know, like this, this Theo, she's now getting an ice pop. Hi. Yeah, um, you know, we had an amazing moment. Let's see. What amazing We had an amazing moment with this, with this. With your, with, we had an amazing moment. We, during, during the beginning of COVID, we were taking this online art class at the School of Visual Arts. And at one moment, yeah, 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 yeah. And at one moment. It's so cool. It could what yeah, is it? That, what is that? It's my my grandpa's ruler. It's your grandpa's oh, a ruler. ruler. It's hard it's to see. Zadie's ruler. Yeah, you know what? We have to show it. You have to bring it close to the camera and open it up so she can see so, how it works. So this is you can close it and then you can open it. Right. So like wait and then you can yeah so and then and then you could close it like this yeah and then you could close it like this right and put it like this right or okay so let me explain or you can have it straight yeah and then you cool. hold it okay this right. way, and then and then you okay and then you do right there you go very, very cool. good so there's two ways and one way how to open okay bye 
Bye. So, bye. We're going to put that back in that back. Uh, yeah, I'll put it back on the shelf. So we were doing this um, to this online art class, and all of a sudden they said, okay, and you're going to need a ruler. And she looked at me and she said, oh, we could use grandpa's ruler. And like we both ran into the room and this thing, which can often become, you know, like it's, you know, her tchotchke shelf, right? So it could become like a little altar, but when something is in an altar and you use it, it changes everything. So it was the first time that like this had gotten used, you know, in years and it folds up because it was in his pocket, right? Because he was a, drafts, a draftsman. Mm. Um, and then she looked at me horrified and she said, I got Sharpie on it. <gasps> I said, oh, that's okay. You would love the Sharpie. That's so great. You got green Sharpie on it. That's great. So, you know, that's like, that's a movie moment. Like that would have been, that would be perfect right. in a film, but that's perfect in life because we used it. And that's, so it is it's, in a way, it's kind of like editing, right? You're like listening for those very special moments that kind of leap off the screen and and do something either because something happens within the frame or it, it happens because you made a transition and you put one crazy piece of footage next to another and in doing that something special happens so in that way editing the stuff but more like using the stuff is like making the movie well the, it's such an interesting idea that, that the sacredness of objects um the the sort of sanctity of objects maybe is is in its is in not using them but the sacredness of them if i'm if i can make that distinction is in using them and and in actually making them part of your life and you know your choice to hold on to the meat grinder was surprising until you used it and were able to make food with this thing that your grandmother had had used i mean in that case i chose the wrong liver I mean, like, I was so obsessed with the sanctity of that object that I wasn't actually thinking about the recipe. Because if I had, I would have used cow liver. And then it would have actually worked. What are you doing? What are you doing? Mommy's really busy right now. OK. So so we have a lot of questions coming in. And I want to invite up. Um, Cindy has a question. And, and we're going to promote her to, to the screen so she can ask it live. Can you, can you go down? OK. Yeah. Bye. Yeah. And Cindy, okay. if you can turn on your camera. Okay. See ya. Hi. 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 Um, I loved your film. I was so, so blown away by it. I every second of it was just fabulous. And um my question is I wanted to know if in the course of making the film, if you feel that your relationship with your mother evolved? And if so, how so? Bye-bye. Hello. Goodbye. So Goodbye. You really do have to go now. Okay. Oh, you really have to go. Okay. Um, well, I think in the course of making the movie, well, the thing is, I mean, I made this movie when my mother was alive for a very short period of time, right? Because I mean, technically, when I started this film, I mean, I mean, my life with my mother evolved from the time that I made a I made a healthy baby girl and I was diagnosed with a clear cell venocarcinoma, TES related cancer, until, you know, my our life was evolving. So and it evolved with every movie that we made a little bit more, I guess. But in terms of this one. I mean, I guess my relationship with my dead mother evolved. Yeah, you know, that's, that's what I guess I was yeah. asking. Yeah, Yeah. I mean, I was just so happy to have her around. It was such a joy to engage with her. It was a joy to see this old footage. I mean, it never, it never made me sad. It actually, um, it just kept her, it kept her around in this very dynamic way. And, um, you know, I think I, I, the best, some of the best films that I've made have actually been with her and through her and with her as a foil or her as a spiritual collaborator, I guess you could say, or her as a reticent participant representing reticent, you know, questioning consumers. So 
you know, she's always, she's helped me find my voice in, in, in some very monumental ways. And in a way, I guess she helped me refine my voice. I think it might have gotten kind of stuck for a while. So in the making, I made, I made this, I was making this, I was making Cooked, which is a movie that I love, but my voice really got stuck. And my voice got unstuck when I went home to help my mother die. And I started kind of writing about the hospice on Facebook. And somehow writing about hospice on Facebook for, helped me find my voice again. Like, and I helped me connect with people who wanted to connect around this hospice experience. And there were people I, I, I'm really good friends with and then people that I'm friends with on Facebook um, who all really appreciated the access into something that I think that they knew that they would have to do one day and that they were terrified of and that I was frankly terrified of. And then there I was, I was in it and I was doing it and it's like able to find the dark humor and make jokes with my mother and, you know, laugh because we both knew she was gonna die before Downtown Abbey came back for season two and she was really pissed that she wasn't gonna be around for it. And I was trying as hard as I could to like pull any connections to try to get it, let her watch it, embargo her reaction, show it after she was dead. You know, like we were actually having quite a good time until the time when she was so sick that she was gonna die. So all of which is to say my voice came back and then and then my voice really came back when we were shooting the stuff. And then my voice really came back when we made Love and Stuff, the short. And then my voice was back and then Theo arrived. And, and you know, and then we really started making this movie for real. So, you know, I think she helped me, our relationship evolved because in the making of the movie, she was helping me parent. And then she was helping me find my voice again. And then, by that point, I had my voice and I could bring it back to Cooked and I could finish that movie too. So now it's like, oh boy, now what do I do? Now she, now she's like, she's, I mean, now she's around in, in these Q and A's, I guess, and in the fact that other people are watching her and now people are having a, a relationship to this movie and are thinking about their relationships. And, and you know, that's, that's the next iteration that's the next way that she evolves is, is that the two of us together help people think about their relationship with their parents, especially if their parents are still living. Thank you for the question, Cindy. Um, we have another question from Jamie who will be coming up now. I think, I, I think it's interesting to hear Theo talk about your mother because clearly her story, um, the story you tell her is also another iteration of your relationship with your mother, the way she'll remember her through your, your telling. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Judith, I wanna say I'm a longtime fan. Uh, I loved A Healthy Baby Girl and Blue Vinyl and all your work and it's Thank wonderful. You. It was really wonderful to watch this. Um, the, in the film, you kind of touch on this theme, the connection between your need to lose weight, your need to um, sort through all your mom's stuff, um, and kind of this need to, to, um, to let go of things seemed to be a theme that you, were, that you were working on and thinking about. And I'm wondering how that has evolved in your life, if you feel like you've overcome it to some extent or you're still thinking about it. No, I think about it every day, all the time. It is still really hard, every bit of it. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I'm... I have to stay on top of the stuff thing and it's hard and I'm not on top of it in a lot of ways. And, you know, you'd think that being home so much and having all this time um, would make things easier, but it actually hasn't, you know, I'm just like working all the time. Um, you know, and the food thing isn't necessarily all that easy either. So it's all a work in progress. And sometimes I feel like I, I have to like start from zero again in some ways. I mean, not completely, but you know, and, but, and then you do, and then you hope that you will. <laughs> so, um, I mean, in a lot of ways, I was like accountable to this movie. So I would often have to do things because we were shooting. Like I had to move it forward 
because it had to move forward for the film <laughs> in some ways. Um, now it just has to move forward for me and for Theo. And um, I mean, so, you know, stuff is still really hard. I, 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 I think it's, and it's harder because I, I can't even invite anybody in to like help me through it. Like I just have to do it myself now. I know that's not satisfying. I'm sure everyone would love to know. It's like, yeah, you know, I, I not only, you know, lost 70 pounds, but then I lost the extra that I was supposed to, to get to 150 and I'm in great shape and I work out every day and one thing comes in, another thing comes out and I don't have a stuff problem. Like we are in the neatest corner of my house right now. <laughs> I, I I love the the title of the film Love and Stuff because it almost it's almost dismissed. I mean, the word stuff is such a a flippant word in a way, but also it's such a weighty one. Can you talk about um, how you came up with the title Love and Stuff? Um, well, I I mean, what else could it be? <laughs> really, I mean, it just sounds so good together. The stuff is a really funny word. I mean. You know, I mean, love and objects would just never be, you know? I mean, this is the thing, like stuff is a double entendre. So there's like, there's the stuff of life, there's your actual stuff, there's your emotional stuff, there's the physical stuff, there's the spiritual stuff, there's the emotional stuff between us, there's the literal stuff, there's the stuff that's too heavy, there's the stuff I'm carrying, there's the stuff I'll never get rid of. It's just, it's such a good, word um and so you know i there's like no there was nothing else it could be i mean i i'm a, i'm a real stickler for um titles i love titles i love coming up with them um i love words and i love language and so i don't know how i just knew i just knew i don't even remember when it just, what else could it be? <laughs> but that's that's how you know a good title is a good title because it works on multiple levels. It's at least a double entendre, if not more. And and once you say it, you can never go back. Yeah, it's it's really great. Um, speaking of stuff, there's a question here from Mark Salaber who says, "Do you still have the storage unit with a lot of stuff in it?" I don't have that storage unit. Is the new one bigger or smaller? <laughs> I have a different, I have another one that I didn't expect to have that's temporary that I can't get into because of COVID. So now I just have to pay the monthly fee. But it's not that one. It's not in Brooklyn. <laughs> it's in a different borough. It will remain nameless. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. I mean, I you know I can't really go and I can't can't go and do anything with that material right now. I can't. We were like in the mid. I I had no more stuff in a storage facility, and then we had the stuff in a room that we shot in. That didn't really make it into the movie. I thought it would, like we shot a whole bunch of stuff in a place where we were going through all the footage and we brought all the footage to, and we thought it would be a really big part of the movie and then it wasn't. And then we moved it from there to a different place and now it's in a different place. Um, I, I was very curious what this has been like for you. I know this is a film, many of the films we're showing in the festival um, and yours too, I think would be wonderful to watch in an audience. I think, you know, this feels like the energy in an, in an audience in a movie theater would be incredible around your film, but also it's a unique experience to watch in your home where I'm sure you have, where most people or many people have things that belong to people um, that they love, that they lost, that they love, that they haven't lost, but that they've shared stories around objects with. Um, what do you think about how people are watching your film now at home and, and what the conversation around that has looked like? Mm. Well, um, I mean, the, the thing that I, that I hope that it does, 
And I, you know, I think it's a really good pandemic film and I would love, I mean, let's ask everyone in the chat and then let's save the chat and send it to the Jewish Women's Archive who I love. So thank you so much for being a co-sponsor along with the, the Boston Women's Film Festival, right? Um, so perfect. I just wish we were all together in the same room and not just the same Zoom. Um, I, I was going to say, the, if, if people are putting things in the chat and want other people to see them, make sure that you have both to attendees and panelists. I'm sure other people in the chat would be very interested to, to hear your thoughts too. Yes, and, and I would, I'm writing it in, I would love to see. Um, I would love to know what it's like for people to watch this at home during the pandemic. I mean, I, I've been very sad that I haven't been able to be with real live audiences, but the one thing that I have felt that's sweet is that maybe this is the right pandemic movie. Like maybe this came out at the right time. Maybe this wasn't about, this was, this is not the movie for, you know, 500 people to watch and, and have a contagious laughter with each other. And then all laugh when I say, you know, step away from the babka, you're not in the babka and you all appreciate it because you know what it's like to have people bring cake to Shiva and bring too much cake and be left alone with the cake. <laughs> it was like, y'all know, right? So that would be the greatest thing in the world to all be able to laugh together at that. Like this movie was built for that collective laugh for the people that know and for the people who don't know, but now know because they've heard 400 other people laugh together. But, you know, that was my fantasy, but, but fantasies don't, you know, my fantasy would be that my mother would still be alive now, but if she was like, she wouldn't, she wouldn't be, you know, 80 something and still be having chemo and making my life miserable because I wouldn't be able to really take care of her and take care of Theo and then have to make a very problematic choice. She would be 75 and healthy and helping me take care of Theo and we would be having a great time together. So, you know, so my fantasy about this movie now, how is it working? Like, I'm hoping that people watch it. They look around at their stuff. They look that they, you know, that they're gentle with themselves, that if their parent is alive, that either they say, oh my gosh, you gotta watch this movie and then we have to talk about it afterwards or that it makes them say, you know, mom, dad, you know, aunt, Dottie, how are you? How are you? How's it going? I just watched this movie that's making me realize that, you know, we should use our time together, even if it's on Zoom, to go through stuff together. Like, I know I've been afraid to do it, but maybe there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, what are the 10 things that you really want to leave me that you know has a great story that you'd be really sad if we didn't talk about together. Like, let's talk about it together. Can you show it to me on Zoom? Like, is it, you know, is it, you know, is it possible for us to talk about the candlesticks? Let's not wait, let's talk about the candlesticks. So that, that's my, that's what my hope is, is that, that if there's someone in your life that you are not, you, you know, that, that you sort of, you're checking in with, but, you're not really making a good enough time to check in with, or you could use that time better, that you'll use this time in a mindful way. But especially for the elders in your life, um, you know, I don't, I think that this COVID thing is gonna get harder before it gets better. And if it's taught any of us anything, that, um, that we actually have to have those really hard conversations. The one I did not wanna have with my mother that I, waited until the week before she died. And she was basically giving me an out while she was really healthy, while she had a lot of life in her. She was asking me, come home, spend time with me and let's go through all the pictures together and let's go through the stuff together. And inevitably we would have had a really good time. We would have had a lot of laughs. I would have gotten, um, I would have gotten, um, I would have gotten, I, I would have gotten so much from her and I would have gotten all the names to all of those, 
you know, brothers, my grandfather's brothers, and I would have found out, I would have gotten the names to the sister-in-laws that my aunt, my, my grandma didn't like, I guess. And I would have found out that my mother saved all of the, all of the RSVPs from all of the people she invited to her wedding. And I would have gotten to know the, all of those names. And then I bet I would have found out like that I have second cousins and third cousins and named Mitsukis, and we would have been able to find them somehow, somewhere. And maybe I would have called them up and said, you know what, you don't know me, but my grandmother, you know, I'm your, whatever. I'm your second cousin's cousin. And the truth is after that opdoc came out, some, this amazing cousin somehow found me on Facebook and wrote me a note and said, I think that I'm, I'm, my grandfather was one of those guys in that picture. Oh, wow. And I think I'm really your cousin. And it turned out that she was, and with a little more digging, it, we definitely realized that we were like, that we had the same great grandfather and that her cousin lived down the street from me mm -hmm. and I met him. So here I had this, I had one of those cousins from that picture living down the street from me for over 25 years, as long as I've been in this apartment. And it took me making the op doc for us to connect. So, you know, the short answer is I want people to have the experience I didn't have, which is- It's interesting. It, it, it sounds like part of the reason it's so hard maybe to get rid of the stuff is, is because you're hoping that there'll be answers in in the things that you haven't discussed with your with your mother. Um, there's a lot of really nice comments coming in, so I I would yeah. love to share share one. Here's from Jeanette. I held on to a few shirts of my mom that fit on me because the wonderful smell that reminded me of her. So the scene where you hold up your mother's skirt and smell it really resonated with me. Um, and there's a nice comment from. Um, Judith Rosenbaum from the Jewish Women's Archive. Who said, we you love her, you and your work. Can you put her on screen? Judith, are you willing to come up? Let us know if you are. She said, we love you and your work and we were so delighted to sponsor this film. Um, let us know and we will, we will have you join us. Um, and maybe then you can share a bit about your story aperture project. So I'll, I'll leave that um, here. Oh, she says, absolutely. So let's invite, let's invite Judith up to join us. There you are. Let's un you have to unmute yourself. I'm not on my what? own computer, so it says not my name because my daughter has my computer right now. Um, but I and I wasn't. I'm not in a good place for. <laughs> but I'm so glad to be able to be here. Thank you so much for. Um, I love the film and and it's really exciting to hear you talk about it. And I resonated with so much of it. My mother kept a lot of stuff and. When she died, it was left to me as a historian to go through it. I'm still going through it. And I remember so many days of sitting on the floor of her office, where that, which was covered, and just going through papers and things and thinking that the process of like physically culling through stuff felt like such a manifestation, like a physical manifestation of the process that you go through of figuring out what of the things your parents gave you, like not the physical things, the legacy you want to keep, you know, what you say thank you and but that's not me and what you internalize and there's so much of that that happens that's not about physical stuff and then there's also so much that of that that happens that's about physical stuff yeah I mean I think that the the, the physical I think the interesting thing about the physical stuff is that for me it um and even with all the footage that I have and hearing my mother's voice and having her be so present is um the physical stuff you know she she I'm able to bring her with me places, you know, like right before I went to vote the other day, I was like, oh, what am I going to take? I need something of you. I need something of you. So I put on my dad's, you know, my dad's favorite red sweater and I buttoned it up. And then I like grabbed a brooch as if I was like trying to get oxygen or something. And like I put this brooch on, you know, and then I grabbed like this. And I was like, why this? I don't, have I ever even seen you wear this? I was like, okay, it's in the box. Just put it on, you know, and then we ran out to vote early, you know. I wore my mother's earrings to vote also. I was like, I have, she would want to be there. And so I needed to find something that, um, that I could bring with me. But it's, um, it's, a, it's, I, I have, I get this very, 
I have this very physical response to it. I mean, somehow it's like, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta find the brooch. Oh, is that your daughter? Um, she had some friends over outside for her birthday. <laughs> oh, oh, wow, nice. So yeah, it's an interesting, but, but then I could hear her voice, right? And then I, she was like, don't worry about me. Make sure Theo goes with you. Make sure she goes inside with you. Make sure that you show her how the ballot works. <laughs> But I, it's like, I, somehow it's like, I needed the brooch to hear the voice to get us out of the house so that we would get there. <laughs> so we, we actually were collecting voting stories and, uh, and we still are on our mobile app. And we, oh, so many people told stories about going to the polls with their mothers or their grandmothers and the things that their, you know, that their parents told them. Um, and I was thinking about that too. But we, one of the things that we realized with this story collecting app that we had is that it could actually be helpful for people who hold on to things because of the stories that are represented by the things and that part of letting go of the object is you have to feel sure that the story isn't going to be lost if you leave the object and so we were like oh this is a way that people could use our app they could take because it, it allows you to take a photo and upload with the story so we're like we could use it that way and I actually talked to a personal organizer about it I was like would this be helpful for you with your clients is there a way for us to Wow. Well, maybe we could maybe we could co-brand the Love Stuff and Zoom workshop with your app. That would be awesome. Um, there's a link to the story aperture um, app now in the in the chat. I'm Judith, I'm, I'm Judith Hellfand. I should, I'm surrounded by Judith <laughs> now. Um, I'm curious if you know, like Judith was talking about, if filming your mother's things and telling the stories through telling telling the story your mother's story and telling the story of many objects through your film did help you sort of detach from the objects um to some extent it did and you know i mean i there's an organizer andrew mellon who's because he his nickname is the most organized man in america um and you could look him up uh he's the guy in the movie who's like you know, d d this is not your life. Like, what is it? He says, like, this is, do not let this become your life. You know, like, don't let going through, this is not, this is your life, not an archeological dig, right? Um, and to some extent, it did help me a lot, right? Like if I could shoot it and I have it and we shot it beautifully and it's in the movie, can I let go of it? What I'm realizing is that I couldn't let go of it for a while, but five years later, I'm like, oh my God, you know what? what did I do with her $9,000, her $7,000 handmade bridge? Like, did I actually let that go? Like, where is that? Like, where, where is the toothbrush? Where is the emery board? Like, where, where did the lipstick go? And I think I'm not sure I know exactly where it is, but now that it's in the movie, I can let it go, right? Like, I mean, it, did, it didn't work immediately at the time, to some extent, but on another level, it sort of did because I was making art out of it. So, um, so it definitely helps. I mean, I think that if you can't, but the worst thing is having stuff has having stuff that has no story. So the truth is, if if you can attach a story to something, you actually do want to keep it. You either can let it go, or you want to keep it because you know that story, and it makes that thing that much more important. And then you're able to say to your daughter, you know, that's your great grandmother's egg slicer, and she's like, I know, you know, man, like, like you saw that in action, and it actually works, like it works. Um, so I think that that you know, either you want stuff that has a story, or you want or you don't need the stuff anymore because you have the story and you could let it go. Uh, I think it's really hard to have storyless stuff. I think that like when the storyless stuff accumulates, you're not really sure that's harder. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a question and comment here from Mary that says, thank you for the beautiful film. I'm going through my parents' house, which is being sold and lived in a cramped apartment. So I'm struggling about what to take and what to leave. So this sort of ties in, she says, what we don't take will end up in a dumpster. So how do you decide? And I think, is it just the the storied? And if everything has a story, is there a way to say goodbye to an object? I have to look at your question. Is, where's Mary's question? Is I'll it? send it to you again, because it's a little bit up here. Um, and I can repeat it for... I mean, um, I'm not, I have to say, I'm not, I'm not a good stuff expert. I'm not, I mean, there are people who like, that is their expertise. And, um, 
I'm going through my parents' house, which is being sold, and live in a cramped apartment, so I'm struggling about what to take and what to leave. What we don't take will end up in a dumpster. Well, I mean, are you sure it has to go end up in a dumpster? Is there any place like a Goodwill or, you know, there are places that are starting to take things again. So if it has, if it's still useful and it's not useful to you, would it make you happy if it could be useful to somebody else? Um, so if it could be useful to somebody else, you know, if you could move, put, if, if your mom's clothing could be, you know, used by someone who really needs the coats and really needs the clothing. Um, and if that's possible, and then I think, you know, if it will, if you think that it would make your mother happy and it would make you feel better than it ending up in the dumpster. Um, I don't think, you know, if, if it's, if, if it makes your life miserable because now your life becomes even more cramped, then that's not going to be good. Great. Great. Um, I just want to share one more comment here from but, Leslie. She said, she if, says, you could I use, if you could use the app, if you could use the app and there take pictures of it, you know, I, but people also do dumpster dive. So if you, if you does it, if it ends up in a dumpster, I hope it's in a, it's in a dumpster that's in a centrally located place where people go to it. Uh, Leslie says, I have a six year old I adopted at birth when I was 60. So I love that part of your story, especially. Um, so. Well, Leslie, are you, are you, you're very, you're, um, you're very brave. <laughs> I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to count. I'm trying like to really live in the present and not worry about how many years are between us, but how good the years are. Um, and it's easier said than done. But that's, a, that's a goal. But I do think there's so many um, aspects of your film that resonate with people on so many different levels. I, it's a, it's an emotion filled movie and um, you know, I, I've watched it now more than once and, and I can't help but cry. I mean, I, even though it's your story and not mine, and I think it's, it's really beautiful. And I'm excited to have you back at some point to do one of your workshops with our community. I think it would be extremely meaningful to so many people. Um, oh, somebody, somebody mentions the Mar Marie Kondo books, which you mentioned earlier before we went live. Have you, have you, I'm curious, have you read them or watched her show? I watched a little bit of her show and I, I haven't read her books. Sorry. I'm sure they're wonderful. I mean, I know people who swear by them. Um, and, um, and I, you know, and I, you know, maybe that would be a really useful thing to do. I mean, I, I've worked with different kinds of organizers and, you know, I don't, I think that they, 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 they are all basically saying the same thing. And, um, you know, more love, less stuff. You know, if you have, you know, everyone has their thing, like with like, and then, you know, only keep the things that you're really using and you really need and, you know, and let go of the rest. And if it, if it's a dumpster where it has to go, as long as it makes, you know, your life is saner and you have more time in your life and are less cramped, then it's all good. I mean, you know, they're, they're all trying to lead us to a place of that where there's, you know, more serenity and, and less angst and where we're not spending all our time searching for our keys and spending more time with our kids. So I think, you know, I, and I think that my mother would definitely want that for me. She would want me to be living in the present with my kid and not be bogged down with her stuff. And I still have some boxes and, you know, in the living room are the elephants. They're in a box. My brother decided that he didn't need them in his house anymore and that we should open them in my house. And literal that, elephants. literally the boxes of all of those <laughs> elephants, we should open them in my house and we should organize them and let Theo organize them and let her play with them until COVID is over and we could have a party and then divide the elephants up. And so I now have three boxes of those elephants in my living room. So wow. I'm, I'm kind of back to that place a little bit. We, we do have to wrap up, but I do think it's really interesting that your brother is one, one takes just a shell and the other has two boxes and, and, and you're the person, even, even now you're the person with the responsibility of, of taking, well, taking you know, stuff. I mean, he, he had a lot more than just a few boxes. I mean, he wound up taking a lot of boxes that said things like, 
too painful to go through, we'll go through later. Painful memories, let's go through them later. I mean, we had boxes that said stuff like that and they wound up at Alex's house and the elephants wound up at his house and I'm just, you know, he's gonna, he's starting to downsize and organize his house so that they can move at some point. And so, you know, the elephants feel like they should live with us and Theo should play with them and that should be the next part of their life. I'm just waiting for the right time. Judith um, commented and she's no longer um, up here, but she said, my mom had a ridiculous number of tote bags from conferences. We joked that we should hand them out as a Shiva party favor. Everyone can leave with a tote bag. Idea. I think that is the gr a great idea. Plus, you know, you're not supposed to ever like leave the Shiva house with Shiva food, but you could put a babka in there too. And it would, it would work out. <laughs> Take I the tote say, I, those babkas looked quite good. I was, uh, <laughs> I was craving a babka after watching. I know yeah, well, that could Amazing. happen. People are all going to run out and get babka after watching this movie, but call your mother first or your father or your loved one. And, um, and I do hope that we at some point can come back to Boston, literally or figuratively and invite people from your community or from surrounding synagogues or however people identify themselves as a community and do a love stuff and zoom workshop and um, and collect your, to help you collect your stories. And maybe we could do it with the Jewish Women's Archive Story app. So Judith, um, expect a phone call from me. <laughs> maybe we could figure out how we could partner together. Great. Well, Judith says she's looking forward to it. We're all looking forward to it. Um, Deb says she loves seeing you and you're wonderful. Um, my and, and Deb Elbaum. Oh, lovely. So thank you all and thank you for everyone who shared uh, personal stories in the chat. It's it's really nice um, in a time where we're all looking at our screens to see some of the community coming out and sharing personal memories and experiences and connecting over a film. And thank you, Judith, for allowing us to do that with your movie. Thank you. Um, it's been a pleasure. And thank you to Theo for her cameo. You can <laughs> pass that on. And we'll see <laughs> all of you at, at more movies over the week. and. Have a great night. Bye. Bye.